Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and an honor, especially as I'm not a number theorist. I communicate with so many number theorists and I always feel like a, like an idiot because they're all so clever and they know so many things. But I still have trouble making, I mean, distinguishing between the Mirbius Mirbius function and, and an amoeba or something like this. Uh, but this talk actually is about, is a talk in number theory proper, I think. And this is kind of the main message that I would like to would like to pass. So this is a talk about the sum product problem, which is one of sort of which everybody presumably knows. Uh, and uh, it has been treated and studied usually as a question of arithmetic or adjective combinatorics or maybe geometric combinatorics. So everything I've everything I've seen done about this problem was done using these methods. But this is, I think, the first time when we fetch uh, number theory proper, and and I and now my the, now the after after this work has been done, I do think about it as a, an open problem in number theory rather than rather than anything else. So this is this is a recent paper. I mean, reasonably recent. Some in the summer it came out in, in maybe in late spring or summer. And it with Brandon Hansen, Ilya Shkredov, and, and Dima, Dima Dmitry Zhelizov. Uh, I, I, I mean, against the rule. This I know this against the pra common practice, but but I emphasize Brandon because he was really the brain behind this project, and uh, and I this could this work could have easily been done without me, but it definitely wouldn't have been done without him. Okay, now I press uh, my cursor and it doesn't work. Oh, okay. So this is this is the Anders uh, Smiridi. So so I'm just I'm gonna quote from from the 1983 Anders Smiridi paper. Uh, I wish I mean I was practicing my Hungarian my my fake Hungarian accent, but but it doesn't sound. I mean it's crap. So I'll just read it in English. So suppose we have uh, an integers. And let's consider integers in the form which are either pairwise sums or pairwise products. And then uh, they, they write, it is tempting to conjecture that for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a threshold value n zero, so that for every n which is bigger than n zero, the number of distinct uh, sums or products is n to the two minus epsilon. So almost n squared, almost as many as, 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 as one can possibly get. And since that paper, this is known as the sum product conjecture. Uh, uh, furthermore, they say, moreover, we conjecture that you can take a longer word that for every k and again, n big enough, there are more than n to the k minus epsilon, that is almost as many as you can possibly get distinct integers in the form which are k fold sums or k-fold products. And even more so, even more carefully, they say perhaps our conjectures remain true if the a's are real or complex numbers. Uh, I, will very, I will say just a few words about these multiple uh, manifold sums or products because the product, the problem is still wide open for, for this case as well. Yes, by the way, if anyone has questions, it would be really good if you just stop me and ask. Right, so so what is best known? Uh, first of all, since uh, a lot, most of the studies, that, or pretty much all of the studies that, that, that I'm aware of have been, has been done over fields and over reals or perhaps finite fields. I'm not going to talk about finite fields in this talk. Uh, but the best, the world record over the reals is that uh, the number of distinct sums and or sums or products is uh, a to the power, which is a little bit bigger than four thirds. So, in other words, one can take epsilon bigger, slightly smaller than two thirds. So, epsilon is how far we are away from the holy grail exponent two. And for multiple sums or products, uh, the result, the known result, is is much weaker and actually known only over integers, so we don't know much of, at all over multiple sums or products 
uh, for for fields. And basically, uh, this rather convoluted looking estimate just says that if you want, so if you have n, if you have n elements in the set A, and you want to reach the cardinality n to the B, this is uh, how many, roughly two to the B squared times that you need to add or multiply the set A with itself. And this is a 2020 result by Brandon Hansen, Oli Rosh Newton, and Dima Zhilizov. Uh, this result follows. And let one. me ask, I suppose n here is the cardinality of A, right? Yeah, n is the cardinality. Yeah. Mm -hmm, thank you. So uh, this, this estimate, it follows from a more specific estimate, which is really the essence of uh, a lot of previous study, it's an asymptotic case of the conjecture, which uh, some people call few products imply many sums, or FPMS. And uh, the specific result which is behind this estimate is this, that in the as asymptotic case when uh, the product case is reasonably small, so A is M times A, and you can think of M as, as the size of A to a very, very small power, so not a log, but a very small power. Then the size of the k-fold uh, uh, sum set is, well, a to the k, this is as much as you would want to get. But, well, there is a little correction, and there is an epsilon sitting, in, sitting here. So if you want an epsilon to be small, well, you're welcome to have epsilon very small versus, say, k. So this correction is uh, is... Can, can be made pretty small. However, the price you pay is that M, the multiplicative doubling con constant, comes in this huge power. Uh, uh, well, you will have to divide by the huge power of M by the power M to the power two over epsilon. So this is, this is the best few product many sums. Estimate and... Uh, mm, we are only going to be talking about the case k equals two. So we're only going to be talking about just some set and product set proper. So from now on, k equals two. And so I'll just, just rewrite this, this estimate for k equals two. So this estimate in this form was obtained by, by Dima Zhilizov and Dormator uh, Palvoldi uh, in uh, about 2016, maybe. You say that seven to maybe nineteen actually. Well, I mean, yeah, in, in the late in the yeah in the so was maybe it was yeah it was two thousand. I think it came out in two thousand and sixteen, uh, and this was what I call a demystification of a famous paper by Burgan and Chang from two thousand and four. So Burgan and Chang had uh, qualitatively the same type of estimate, maybe with a slightly weaker numerology, but their paper was. I mean, it's still, that paper is still inaccessible for, for myself, for, 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 for a lay reader like myself. Uh, on top of this, I should add that just recently, uh, so this 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 Gilles of uh, Palverde proof, I really like this proof. So it's, I mean, there are two papers. There was an, it's based on a, on a paper with more authors. Uh, there was also on that, on that other paper, Dormotor wasn't on that paper, but was Imre Ruja and, and Georges Chacan. Uh, and uh, and uh, goodness, Matolci Jr., the son of Mate Matolci. Uh, what's his first name? I don't remember. So um, yes, so so they kind of wrote what I call the demystification of Bugan and Chang. However, just recently in two thousand and three, in in two thousand and twenty three, this summer, there is uh, there there is this paper of. Uh, the trio, I mean, uh, Ben Green, uh, Freddie Manners, and, and Terry Tao, uh, where they reprove this estimate, even, if, I mean, they reprove, well, this estimate even slicker using entropy. So the proof is even shorter now. Does, I mean, it's quite mysterious as far as I'm concerned, but uh, so now there is also an entropy proof of this estimate. Right, so a few sort of technical things that, that again probably everyone knows. So um, 
first of all, we're going to be talking about energy, mostly additive energy. So energy or the second moment of convolution. So we just roughly. So in other words, this is just the we take every sum in the sum set and uh, take and 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 add up. Uh, so R is R is the number of realizations of the sum. So we take with sum the squares of the number of realizations. And uh, since we're talking about this equation, this equation can be rearranged so the terms can be moved around. So the energy is either this, the realizations of sums or the realizations of, of differences. And S for S stands for sum, obviously, and D for a difference. Uh, and multiplicative energy is defined, obviously, in a similar way. Mm. And if we look at this energy quantity, so if we if we multiply if we had a power one here instead, then we just count the total number of realizations of of of, of all sums, and that would be a squared. And if we took a maximum maximum number realization, which is a itself, then it would be a cubed. So there's a trivial estimate on both sides for the energy. And Cauchy-Schwartz, of course, tells us that the cardinality of a plus or minus a is bounded by this ratio. In other words, in other words, and this has has how so many things have been done. In order to uh, bound cardinality from below, you need to find you need to bound the second moment from above. So most in so many things, like say say the the Guthenkast resolution of of uh, the Erdős distance conjecture. Which I still think is is one of the most one of the most impressive papers that I've ever seen, if not the most impressive paper. So this is what what's being done. So instead of estimating the cardinality, and that's in that case the set of distances uh, from from below, you estimate the energy from above, and then use Cauchy-Schwarz. And just for bookkeeping, exponential sums can be used. So if you just define a function on a circle. And just as an exponential sum with the frequencies in your set A, then this energy is just the fourth power of of the of the L four norm uh, of this of this exponential sum because basically complex conjugation responds to the minus sign, and uh, so there there are two of these fours come from come from here, and there are two uh, there are two more of these fours come from there. So this is just a tautological just just tautology. Otherwise, in other words, if this relation doesn't take place between the between the exponents, when you when you take, I mean, when you when you take the fourth power of this expression, you just get the, in, an integrate over the circle. You get zeros. Right. So traditionally, the sum product problem was approached in the following way: one would try to bound energy via the opposite sex set. Uh, and uh, say one of the versions is a well-known estimate by Scheumacher from 2008, which bounds the multiplicative energy via the sum set. So it just says that the multiplicative energy is bounded pretty much by the sum set squared, well, with a log that you can that you cannot actually get rid of. And uh, this estimate immediately implies FSMP. FSMP meaning few sums, many products. In other words, if we have few sums, if A plus A is about the size of A, then the multiplicative energy of A is pretty trivial. So as we said, as we've seen before, energy always sits between the size of A squared and the size of A cubed. So if A plus A is roughly A, then the energy is pretty much A squared. And this is kind of the trivial case, which automatically implies that, that the number of products is almost as big as it gets up to, up to the log. So a uh, few sums, many products, issue closed. Uh, it's true. Sorry, yeah, few sums, many products is true done, done for reals, so for integers as well, of course. Now, a uh, few products, many sum. Here we only know about Z. We don't know, we don't have uh, an analog for, for the reals. We have some partial results for the reals that I'm not going to talk about. So this is this is uh, these are the estimates that were that were started by Bogan that come from Bogan and Chang and their demystifications, and 
the n the s the estimate is now in this form so that if the product set if the if the multiplicative constant is m if the product set is m times bigger than a then there is a large subset of a and throughout a prime will always denote a large sub 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 subset of a so basically you can think of a a prime e equals a at least in cardinal a large enough subset uh, such that the, the such that this this subset has a reasonably small energy. So a squared is again this is the minimum energy, the minimum possible. Well, there is a four epsilon. Okay, I mean we all often have to pay in in in, in various epsilons, but on top of this, unfortunately, the, the, then there is this factor, which of course grows pretty wild as epsilon goes to zero. So these estimates are really asymptotic. So, so they hold for M perhaps equals uh, cardinality of A to the power of one over a thousand or something like this. But, but uh, for the genuine sum product conjecture, when say when we think of A such that its product set maybe is A to the three halves in size or something like this, this is pretty useful. I mean, this is completely useless. Uh, but having this estimate, having so this estimate suggests that perhaps so. So here, but we basically prove that that uh, that if A has a small product set, then uh, we have a large subset whose energy is as small as we wish, pretty much. Uh, maybe we want to. Maybe is it, can we conjecture the following statement? The following sort of. Uh, product set versus energy statement which would weaken a little bit which would which would um, which would be stronger than our some product conjecture can we say the following is this true that that uh, that a has well again has a large subset a prime the way i've written this estimate a prime doesn't have to be large but but let's think about this large so is that true that any every set a has a large subset a prime such that the following takes place either the product set, or what would what the Cauchy Schwartz would have given me for the cardinality of a of a prime plus a prime. So this is what the Cauchy Schwartz would give me for cardinality of a prime plus a prime, right? There it is. So Right, so either the product set or what I would get from Co or my Cauchy Schwartz estimate for for or the consequence of my Cauchy Schwartz estimate for for the energy of A prime would give me almost A squared. So this is a stronger statement than the sum product conjecture. The answer is no. Uh, the best you can expect is the power five thirds rather than the power two. And the example uh, is very simple. It was done by Balaguli, 2017, and there it is. So what we're going to take, we're going to take an interval between 1 and n, 1 and n squared, 1 and little n squared. So the cardinality of A is n cubed. So we have an interval n squared, and then we take n dilates of this interval by powers of some huge prime. So P is just bigger than, than the interval. So we take this interval and take its gigantic dilates. And, and the dilates, I mean, the, the dilates differ from, from one another so much that different dilates just have no additive interaction with one another. And so if we look at the product set, then of course, uh, when we when we do products, so these powers j, they come from, they are, they are just, uh, they're, they're an arithmetic progression between one and n. So when we, when we multiply, we sum the powers and the maximum power is gonna be just two n. So in other words, mm. on the, so the, the size of the product set is smaller than a to the power of five thirds. So why is that? So, so again, when we multiply these, when we multiply the interval from one through n squared, we get almost n to the fourth. But we don't really get n to the fourth, we get n to the fourth divided by some log n, log to some power. And on top of this, we get uh, different powers of p and we get n powers. So we get, we, get, we get almost a to the fifth, but not quite. 
And since, uh, sorry, we'll get, we get almost n to the fifth, but since the cardinality of a, a, a is, is n to the third, we get a to the five, a to the five thirds. This is the product set. And on the other hand, when we do the energy, oh, well, again, we have a problem here because every element of a, every element of a is a member of some arithmetic progression of length n squared. So when we look at this element of A as an element of A plus A, this element will have N squared, the length of the arithmetic progression realizations as a sum of product. So we square this N squared, we get A to the fourth. So we get uh, N to the seventh, which is A to the seven thirds. And that accounts for this estimate, five thirds is the best that we can get. And this little o, little o of one is genuine. And on top of this, uh, nothing will change if we take any large, this argument will not break down if instead of A itself, which is just a union of arithmetic progressions, or, which are exist on kind of different scales and don't interact with each other additively. And nothing will change if we, mm, take reasonably large subsets of these arithmetic programs. So this five thirds is what is the best we can get. And this is the main result I'm gonna talk about. So suppose A is the subset of Z and then there exists A prime subset of A such that the A prime is large in cardinality and the estimate I've just claimed holds. However, the little, so in this here, over here, that there's a little O of one, just uh, just subsumes all sorts of logarithms. I mean, well, this specific logarithm. But here, there's a little O that depends on R, and there is no R in this formulation, so there is unfortunately a condition to this theorem. The condition is that if each member of the set A has at most R prime factors, it doesn't mean that the set A, of course, is spanned by a few number of uh, a few primes. No, not at all. I mean, each now each member of A has its own prime factors. But what matters is that the number of prime factors for each A is bounded then by by log by almost by log A. And I wish I could make it log A, but I can't. So it has to be an epsilon. If we return to this example, what I want to say is this is certainly true a propose of this example because because I can just take instead of this interval instead of this interval I can just take an arithmetic progression of primes. We know that there are arithmetic progression of primes as long as I want, and then I'll take this extra prime, just really gigantic, much bigger than than I mean gigantic in comparison to this to this arithmetic progression of primes, and I will still get these five thirds. And if I do this, then in this case, my R would be just equal to two. Every member of A will be just will just have two prime factors. This common prime gigantic P and one and one of the primes from the arithmetic progression. So already for for two prime factors, this problem is not trivial. In fact, that was Simiredi who asked this question. So um, at some point he was, so I, I told him at some point, oh, like I mentioned this air distance problem as solved. And he said, oh, no, 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 it's not solved. What about the single distance problem? This is the real problem. And then, and then, and then he said, oh, you guys are working with these some products. Can you actually do something maybe in this case when, when when you when every member of your set or your let's work with integers, you said when every member of your set of your of your set has say ten prime factors, and then this is how we started thinking about it. And then and then we realized that even even two prime factors pose a problem, so we started thinking about just two prime factors. And then it went on to more prime factors. So now we can handle this now. Okay, and there is an interesting corollary which follows from already methodology, so it's not obvious from the theorem. So parallel to the sum product problem, people were studying this quantity 
so A plus or minus AA. And here's an interesting estimate that, that this A, so of course, if we take either an arithmetic progression here, so it, we take an interval from, from one through from one through n, and then AA is, is pretty much everything from one through, a, a, through n squared, and AA plus AA is still everything from one through n squared times two, whatever, all constants are equal to one. Uh, so the estimate would be just A squared in size. Or we can take A as a geometric progression. Of course, a, if A is a geometric progression, then A times A is A itself. But when we add, it's when we add a geometric progression to itself, we'll, we'll square its size as the sum set. So, but here it says, and this here is an interesting corollary that this quantity is always much bigger than a squared, unless there are two endpoint cases, uh, and the endpoint cases are either the product set is large, so either m equals uh, either m equals um, a in the size of a, or when the product set is very small, so when when m is very small. So now what are the ingredients? And now why, why is this a number theory problem? So there are three ingredients. The first ingredient is structure theorem, and the structure theorem is combinatorics. All the three ingredients so far would break down if we removed this few prime factors assumption. Some of them require some of them more stringent in terms of the number of prime factors, some of them are less stringent, but Weirdly enough, they're quite compatible, all the three. I mean, they, 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 the number of prime factors they can digest is, is kind of more or less the same. So one is the structure theorem. This is just basic combinatorics and pigeonholing. Uh, the other one is, well, we worked on this one pretty hard and we did most of it ourselves. And then we discovered a paper which was called The Martingale that Occurs in Harmonic Analysis. This is the title of the paper by Gandhi and Veropoulos from 1976. This was a review paper. And that paper, and we realized that that paper can be just used as a black box for what we want. And uh, there is another, well, application of a result back from around those times which is Schmidt's sub subspace theorem, a special case of the subspace theorem. And this is, of course, I mean, this is the number theory. Well, I mean, miles beyond my understanding you know, of number theory. And interestingly enough, it also comes seemingly in indispensable. So, so this, is, this is kind of genuine harmonic analysis, not just bookkeeping. So I say, I, I've written exponential sums above, but I said that those exponential sums are just for bookkeeping. No, this is harmonic analysis proper. I mean, you really can't see it just on one side of the Fourier transform. And uh, and the sub subspace theorem, well, the subspace theorem is the subspace theorem. There it is. So there is the version that we're going to use. Mm, so suppose we have R primes, and they generate a multiplicative group, gamma, uh, uh, and then we take some number L and we compose a linear combination. So we take a bunch of coefficients from A1 through AL, whatever they are, we fix them. And now we look at the number of solutions of the equations of uh, when we have a linear combination of these fixed A's and some elements of our group, G, uh, uh, such that the sum equals to one. And we need no degenerate solutions, of course, because if we had degenerate solutions, if some subsum was equal to zero, we could have come up with a much larger number of solutions altogether. So if we count these non-degenerate solutions, then the number of solutions is bounded by the length. L is the length of this linear combination to, well, a large power. But most importantly, there is this rank here in this bound. So L times R. And then these three pieces will come together. Okay. So first, let me show you how that without any number theory, without any harmonic analysis, the exponent three halves is easy 
and all it needs is the structure theorem and element and and and, and, and structure theorem and basics. So here's the statement of the structure theorem. It's very convoluted, but I'd like to sort of to to demystify it because it's it's very simple and it's 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 very easy to prove. So it says that there is a large subset of A which has structure. And the structure is as follows. So there exists a bunch of primes. So altogether, every member of A has R primes. So these, so there exists a set of common primes. So this set, this set A prime is spanned is, so every member of A prime, A prime is divisible by one of the common primes. So the number of common primes is, common primes is R prime. So, and now every member of our set, every member of our subset A prime looks like this. So we have uh, some sort of say, set B, which I think of as a base set. And each element of this B is multiplied by a bunch of powers of these common primes. So it's a pretty easy statement. So in other words, every member of A prime looks like uh, B, an element from the base set, times the element of G, and G is exactly uh, this group generated by these common primes. So every element of A prime is the element of a base set B times some element of G. And moreover, everything can be regularized. So the set of Gs multiplying different Bs can be different. But what is important is that, and this is general, general kind of pigeonholing, not much to do really, so that essentially the number of powers of each of these primes multiplying every b is roughly the same up to say power up to up to say factor of two or something like this. So and this is the expression of this. So that every every b in the base set is multiplied by l one prime l one powers of the first by l one powers of the first prime by some number l two powers of the second prime and finally of the last prime. So in other words, every element B of the base set is multiplied by approximately some number L of the element of, of G's. So G is the element of the group generated by these common primes. And this number L is pretty much the same for every B. And therefore, therefore we have an estimate, of course, that uh, roughly speaking, the, the size of A prime is just L, the number of primes multiplying every element B and the size of B. And this is pretty much A. So let's just think that L B equals A in size. And on top of this, when we multiply A with itself, or oh, one thing, one more, more important thing I didn't say is that 50% of the pairs of the base, base set are co-prime. So when we multiply B with B, we get B squared. So B, in other words, pretty much has no multiplicative structure. All the multiplicative structure has been <coughs> taken into this part, into this, into this group gamma over here. And so the product set, the size of the product set is at least A squared times L. In other words, when we when we multiply, when we multiply we lose from the maximum possible value. We lose the factor of L because because the, these these uh, we don't, we know nothing about these powers of these primes and all, all these powers can be in some kind of arithmetic progressions. So that's the structure theorem. In addition to this, there is an old lemma by Chang from two thousand and three. There was an annals paper of Chang uh, in two thousand and three in. Uh, on the sum product conjecture, and this whole paper was based on this lemma. This lemma is very easy. So this lemma evaluates additive energy of the set A. Uh, it says that suppose A is a subset of Z, symmetric. Symmetric means A, A and minus A is the same. So we don't have to differ between some between sums and, and differences. So P is some prime. And let us just call uh a v the part of a 
such that <coughs> uh, such that the p valuation of every a in this part equals v. So in other words, a v is the is is are the elements of a which are divisible exactly by p to the power of v. Not a biggest power, not a bigger power of p, not a smaller power of p. And then the energy of a is bounded by the sum over v. So v corresponds to different powers of this p uh, of these energies. And what does that mean? So the energy, the total energy is the number of solutions of this equation. Every Each of these a's is divisible by some power of p. All this lemma says is that it is not possible that the powers of p divided by these four, four a's are all different. Because if they're different, that's a contradiction. Say, uh, if say if this one is not divisible by p at all, and these three are divisible by different powers of p, then we get a contradiction because it would imply that this one actually is divisible by p. That's it. So this is this this is the content of Chang's lemma, uh, and if we now have this estimate. And the Cauchy-Schwartz, this estimate, so this is just the usual Cauchy-Schwartz inequality with energy notations, if you haven't seen, it doesn't matter. So there's the usual Cauchy-Schwartz inequality that tells you that this is, this is what it is. Now you cancel the square root out and, therefore, and, and apply it to and combine it with this statement. So when you combine it with this statement, so basically this lemma tells you that the energy of A prime equals L squared times the energy of B. A prime itself is in size L times B. The worst possible case for the energy of A prime would be L cubed times B. In other words, when you estimate the energy of A prime, you win a factor of L. So the worst case is L cubed times, times B cubed, but then you get L squared times B cubed. On the other hand, as we said, on the product set, we lose exactly the quantity L. So when we take, when we put these two things together and we, we optimize, we get this estimate with the exponent of three halves. Done. Everything else that I'm still going to be talking about in the last 20 minutes, to 10 minutes, in the last 10 minutes is how to improve these three halves to, to five thirds. Three halves is basic. There is no analysis, no number theory is in a sense, and there's only pigeonhole principle, that's it. And divisibility. So this is this, this can be taught to, I mean, to anyone. Now from two thirds to five thirds, <clears throat> this is the main thing in a sense that's an improvement. So the main claim is that the energy of A is bounded by a much stronger. So there's a much stronger bound. So here in Chang's lemma, all we require is that the p-valuations of these two guys are the same. And the p-valuations of these two guys can be anything. The strengthening is that as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, the p-valuations here have to be equal and the p-valuations here have to be equal. So I've written it uh, new gamma of A1 equals new gamma of A2, which means, which means that the, the valuations of A1 and A2 must be equal relative to all common primes, uh, P1 through, uh, P1 through PR. So we have common primes P1 through PR, and all, all valuations of these two of terms in the left-hand side have to be equal, and all valuations of the two terms in the right-hand side have to be equal. So this is a much stronger quantity that bounds. And for that, this is kind of, well, this is, this is, this is kind of harmonic analysis proper in a sense, so it uses maximal functions and, and, and stopping times and standard, but, but but 20th century, definitely. 
So from here we conclude. So from here we can. So so the conclusion of this is more or less immediate. So when when we decide that if we assume that this is true, then the conclusion is that the energy of a prime. So that set a prime that we got from the structure theorem is a prime square. This is just a trivial term. These are trivial solutions. This is when these two guys are equal and those two guys are equal. So this is a prime squared. And on top of this, on top of this, this is the case that. So this is the case. This is this is what's left. Why is that so? <clears throat> because uh, if we use a structure, if we use a structure theorem, so each of these A's is B times some element G. So, and this says that the G is corresponding. So, so there are two B's here underlying these A's. And this says that uh, the, mm, the elements of the group here have to be the same. And the same thing here. So basically, uh, so, so, so there is some G here and there is some G prime here. And when I divide them, this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to get an element of the group. So the energy is bounded by, by this expression. In other words, I can think about it like this. So suppose A1 is, is anything. Uh, then what do I know about A2? Uh, I know that the... Uh, group element multiplying a2 is the same so for a2 i only have the b and as far as a3 and a4 are concerned all their options are going to be subsumed in 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 this quantity so when b my so when well this is going to be b3 and b4 b3 and b4 fall into the group And now, how do I evaluate this quantity? And this is this is where number theory kicks in. To evaluate this quantity, unless the rank equals one. If the rank equals one, I can do, if there's only one common prime, I can do it by hand, like in a one page induction proof. But if I have more than one common prime, then I need the full power of the subspace theorem. And this is the statement. And this statement says that this quantity is pretty much B. It's b times something very small. It's b to the power is b to the power one plus little o. So, in other words, in other words, uh, if I look at this solution and I say b one minus b two equals equals one, then of course the number of solutions can be as large as b. But if b one minus b two lies in a whole multiplicative group, then the number of this of the of, of possible solutions doesn't is not much worse. It's still pretty much b well times something which is little o of the size of b. That's the subspace theorem. And if I put these things together, uh, you can trust me. If you, I put these things together, I'm going to get my statement, my, my exponent 5 thirds. So essentially, essentially, what does that tell me? This tells me that, so I know that I've lost the quantity L that size of 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 uh, yeah, I lost the quantity L on the product set. And now, if I look at if I look at the energy, how much do I win? I win a prime, and then I have uh, b squared. So a prime is b times L. So this is L times b cubed. So I have one L squared on the energy. In the trivial case, I won uh, L on the energy, but here I win L squared. And when I put this together and optimize, instead of uh, three halves, I get five thirds. Right, so in the last five minutes, I'll just give you a few hints on how this is proven and just drop a few names, really. So suppose we have just one common prime. So our set A, Suppose A and the same as A prime. So our set A looks looks as follows. So there's a base set B, and every element of the base set B is multiplied by a bunch of powers of the prime P. And the number these powers, this set V of B, can be different for different Bs, but the cardinalities of each V of B is roughly the same and equal to L. 
And this is the main proposition, a proposition in the case, case rank one. So that if we do this energy, then uh, the P valuations of A1 and A2 must coincide. So A1 and A2 are, so A1 and A2 have some value, some P valuation V, and A3 and A4 have some P valuation V prime. So therefore, and therefore, what happens is this. So when we calculate the energy, again, so there's a trivial term. This term corresponds to A1 equals A2 and A3 equals A4. And now suppose we're dealing with non-trivial terms. So we have A prime choices for, for A1. Knowing A1, we know uh, the p-valuation of A2. So we have B choices for A for, for A2. And now we know that A3 and A4 have an equal p-valuation. So um, suppose this B corresponds to A3, B prime corresponds to A4. So then B minus B prime must lie, well, maybe not in G itself, but in a coset of G, which is defined by, by this quantity, but in a fixed coset. And of course, it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's gamma or, or coset of, of gamma, because I mean, we can just divide, divide the B and B prime by gamma. So the estimate doesn't matter. So if I want an estimate like this, it's a very easy estimate because, because gamma is just, so I can just, so gamma is just one, rank one group. So I'm just talking about powers of the prime P. I can write everything uh, in digits mod P. I can write all, all the elements of B in digits mod P, uh, shift things around and prove this estimate. And there is this little law of one is actually a log. So there is not much to do here. It's like one page, one page exercise. Here. But this only works for rank one. So for rank one, I don't need any subspace theorem. For rank one, namely for one common prime, namely for the balog woolley example in a sense, uh, well, for refined balog woolley example when I have an arithmetic progression of primes multiplied by powers of some other prime, then this five thirds comes for well, the main thrust of these five thirds would be would be in this in this in this martingale harmonic analysis proposition. So. Just, just one word about the proof. So just again, this is name and term dropping because there is obviously no time and, and it's, it will be too much. Uh, so what I do is I consider an, ex, an exponential sum over the set A. So I have one common prime and uh, I consider an exponential sum. And what I do here is I group this exponential, I mean, I, I partition this exponential sums basically by the powers of prime P multiplying A. So these powers are V. And then I define the square function. So this the square function is kind of the standard quantity in harmonic analysis in March, I mean, in maximal function theory and little with Pali and whatnot. And this is the standard definition. So what I do defining a square function, I take each piece so each piece of the exponential sum, which is divisible by specific, where the frequency is divisible by specific power of p, take the square of the L2 norm, sum them over v's, and take the square root. So this is this is the square. This is a square function, and this is the theorem from 1970. And this theorem tells me that for any q between bigger than one, the 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 Q no, the LQ norm of the exponent of FT itself is of the same magnitude as the uh, well, is given is is of the same magnitude as as the LQ norm of the of the of the square function, and this is exactly what my statement about energy says about equal p variations on the left hand side and the right hand side. So this is a so so the application of this theorem is a tautology. So this is a maximal function. So this is a little bit, but again, we don't have time for this. So th th this, these are just the standard additional construct constructs that, ha that have to be created in order to prove in order to prove this inequality. Moreover, this inequality works in the in the opposite direction as well. And this is necessary to embrace more prime primes. So on the proof, all I want to say and finish probably at this point. Yes, definitely finish here. So on the proof, 
all I do is, so I take my exponential sum. So this is just the sum of complex exponential where frequencies lie in my, my set A. And I split this exponential sum into pieces where the valuation uh, of where A is divisible exactly by P to the V. But I also need to consider a cutoff of this sum. So I will cut off the sum by those A's which are divisible by say P to the 10th or higher power of P. And then all I need to notice is that I can just rewrite this in this form. So in other words, if I just if I if I take the part of the exponential sum uh, where I have a's which are divisible by p to the power 10 or higher, I will obtain I can obtain this the value of this exponential sum as a point t as follow as follows. I would take the point point t on the unit circle and then average my quantity around the right polygon with p to the 10th vertices. So, and that's why it, th these quantities, these cutoffs uh, form an inverse martingale. So I will be, I will be taking a point on the unit circle T and then average my, my exponential sum over, over the right polygon with p to the, p to the V or vertices. And of course, uh, the bigger V, uh, the, more detailed average I'm getting, and that's why it's a marching game. And then all I need is I can basically go on Wikipedia and 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 and, and kind of dig out some some martingale inequalities and apply them in the correct way and apply Kirchhoffish Schwartz uh, and get the result, get the main proposition for rank one. And for rank higher than one, I need more harmonic analysis tricks. I need some hinging. I need the hinging inequality. I need some randomization. I need the inequalities going the other way. But this is all doable. And well, if I race through these pages, I arrive in the in this quantity, which is again the same thing: b1 minus b2 falling into the group where the group now has r generators. And for that, I have my I have the subspace theorem. getting there. Yes, I use this formula. Uh, there's a little lemma in there, but this R is crucial. And this this really uh, this really imposes this is this is the most stringent imposition of this condition. And I guess it's time to stop.